So the question, uh, the question for this year, not to put too sharp a point on it, is, uh, our, uh, is our species going to survive? Is the human race uh, going to be able to survive the multitude of threats that are being hurled our way, including many of them that are novel or at least only recently brought to our attention? So our an ancient ancestors faced harsh climates and ice ages, pestilence, disease, predators of vastly superior physical strength, at times the battle may have seemed hopeless for Homo sapiens, but here we are today alive and kicking. So clearly we prevailed, and we prevailed through our fitness in an evolutionary sense, including our resourcefulness in adapting to new and changing environments and the potential, potentially final threats. So today we consider, ironically, uh, threats that uh, are coming from our own intelligence, where we may unwittingly be doing ourselves in, although uh, thankfully we have not yet uh, brought it quite to that point. We are, by the way, I should point out, dealing with a somewhat new or overhauled Kyle Morrow room today, thanks to, thanks to the efforts of Chuck Henry, who's in the back of the room. Uh, Bob Curl will be trying out a brand new video system, so that should be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> So we launched our series this year with, a, uh, with an initial talk by uh, the well-known Houston attorney, Jim Blackburn, who spoke to us using a local illustration, namely having to do with threats to the Texas shoreline. And then we proceeded on with Carolyn Summers from Houston's Museum of Natural Science, who talked about uh, outer space and our prospects for vacating this planet and moving on uh, to, uh, to a new piece of real estate somewhere else in the cosmos, should we ever need to uh, come to that. Uh, following uh, Dr. Curl's talk today, we have a couple, two or three more colloquia that are planned for the balance of the year. Uh, we're all excited, I know, uh, for the next one coming up on February 17th by our own Neil Lane, university professor and fellow in the Baker Institute, um, who will be talking about uh, things that go click in the night, the nuclear conundrum. So if that sounds scary, uh, it's probably because it is. Um, you know, uh, when this series is over, I was thinking that it might be a good idea for us to bring in a professional therapist, someone like Lindy Doran from the Rice Counseling Center, uh, to sort of calm us all down, or perhaps we could just uh, go with more wine at the wine and cheese reception that follows uh, the final talk. Uh, and I know that we'll all be interested in hearing from Ron Sass, whose talk back last fall had to be postponed as Ron was dealing uh, with a health issue. But uh, for those of you who with good vision or were paying attention, you know Ron is with us today. And so uh, with his doctor's uh, uh, permission, if all continues to go well, he'll be addressing us at the end of the coming semester in the April 13th slot, I believe it is, uh, talking to us about uh, global warming. So Ron is great to see you were here today and I think many of you know, most of you know that Ron chaired the committee on Ciencia that put together this year's program. I don't seem to be able to hold the microphone and turn my pages at the same time. Uh, just a final note on the format, uh, Bob Pro will talk for the usual 50 minutes and then we'll go through questions and answers. Uh, so if you have questions, be sure to know what you do. Ask them loudly and clearly enough that Bob doesn't have to repeat them for the rest of the room. Uh, and then we'll break after question and answers for this uh, of wine and cheese reception. And so now for our, the reason that we're here today to hear uh, Professor Robert F. Curl, who is, uh, well, one always hears these introductions about speakers who need no introduction, and that usually is a slight bit of hyperbole, but in Bob's case, it's, it's actually true. Uh, he really needs no introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. Uh, Bob Curl was born in August 1933 in Alice. Uh, that's between Bishop, Texas, and San Diego, Texas, as I'm sure most of you know. It's about an hour west of Texas. Uh, he was the son of a Methodist minister who lived in various towns in South and Southwest Texas during his youth and childhood. Uh, Bob tells me that his interest in chemistry was sparked by a chemistry set he received as a Christmas present at age nine, a gift his mother was subsequently, uh, subsequently to regret, Bob explains, and perhaps he can elaborate on that later. But he attended uh, the then called Rice Institute, received his BA, and in his undergraduate uh, natural products course, he heard about Kenneth Pixer's discovery of barriers to internal rotation about single bonds. Of course, we all remember when we were talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> and decided to go on uh, to Berkeley to work with Pixer. And I'm sure all of you know that Pixer's 
came back here and was president of the university, and Rice, and then went on to become president of Stanford. But at any rate, uh, after Bob received his PhD in 57, he was still fascinated by internal rotation. He went to Harvard uh, for a year to work with E.B. Wilson in microwave spectroscopy. In 1958, he joined the faculty at Rice as an assistant professor where he's been since, except for various sabbaticals. He's been master of Lovett College and chair of the chemistry department. He is currently the Kenneth S. Pitzer Schlumberger Professor. I mean, how many of us are in endowed chairs named after our dissertation advisor? It doesn't happen all that often. In 2003, Bob was named University Pre uh, Professor, which of course advises the highest academic title uh, one can have. Uh, this past year, Bob was elected by the faculty to serve on the crisis presidential committee where his energy and insights proved uh, invaluable and where um, a number of uh, former colleagues continue to be colleagues with him and personal friends of uh, Bob. Um, Bob's research activities have been in several fields of chemistry, but the most consistent being in high resolution spectroscopy, and he is best known as one of the co-discoverers in 1985 of carbon cage compounds called fullerenes. Uh, that discovery, of course, from Bob and Rick Smalley and Carol Croco of the University of Sussex, uh, the 1996 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Actually, what Bob said over his brief biographical statement to help me prepare this introduction, he noted a number of things in his record but didn't mention having received a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I don't know how many of the rest of us <laughs> would make that oversight, but uh, I checked on the web and learned that. Nobel Prize, but I think that... No, if we're in my con, we'll be... Well, I think this just gets lying to that box, and he's kind of going to be mention a uh, minor detail like that. I can't do justice to the list of other awards about one, but just to name a few. Uh, he's won the Clinton Prize in the Institute of Mechanical Engineering in 1957, the Alexander von Humboldt Senior U.S. Scientist Award in 1972, and the American Physical Society in 1992 and a National Prize for New Materials, which he also shared with Small and Quilter. So as always, let me ask you to turn up your cell phone. Bob, you're wearing a cell phone, let me ask you to turn up your cell phone. <laughs> and let us all tune in to Bob Pro, his title is, Is Our Intelligence Impairing Our Chances for Survival? Bob Pro. First of all, we always check to see whether the mic is working. Is it working back? Good. Um, the title of this series, as you notice, is, is uh, the question of, if, of is humanity going to survive? And of course, we all know the answer to that is no, not, not, not ultimately. Um, but uh, I think the, the, the purpose was, would it be any time soon that uh, we, uh, we kicked off, so to speak? Now, when I first saw this title, I said, well, gee, I don't really see any reason why all of humanity will be any extinguished anytime soon. That's, you know, what am I going to talk about? Um, and the, um, it did give me an idea of talk about, well, we may not, we may not uh, um, all be killed anytime soon, but we might be miserable and even perhaps wish we were dead. So uh, there, are, there are kinds of doomsday scenarios that are somewhat different from, from nobody, nobody's alive to turn off the lights. Um, now, I'm going to be talking about intelligence. And the first thing one wants to think about is, does intelligence really have anything to do with the survival of a species? And this is a uh, answer to that question that was proposed recently, and that is, well, you know, most of the history of life has nothing to do with intelligence. And there, therefore, there might not be, I think the implication is a whole lot of correlation be, between intelligence and survival. And one can, you know, for example, we're probably not as tough as fire ants. Uh, but we can claim to have a wider habitat range than fire ants. Uh, and I think that the chances are that, uh, considering our wide habitat range, that it's unlikely that we'll uh, be wiped out. But there is a question of, uh, 
the, the title of this talk is actually Intelligence Impairing Our Chances for Survival. And the point is that uh, we've had a, a technological revolution that's been fed by the scientific revolution. And every big technological change, uh, have always, there's always intended or unintended consequences which are, have, are negative. And I thought that I would explore some of these today. Uh, we may actually get around eventually to bumping ourselves off. Uh, we, we, you know, for many millennia, we didn't have the ability to uh, really affect the, the world globally. And it's becoming obvious in the last few years that we've now succeeded in having global effects on the whole world. Uh, the common excited examples are global warming, depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer, global pollution, uh, depletion of fisheries, uh, and there are probably many others that could, could go on that list. So we may succeed. You know, if we try hard enough, we may actually make the world uninhabitable. Uh, but I don't see that. I can't figure out the this, this, this scene in which that would happen. Um, so I want to talk specifically about uh, really two things. One is uh, weapons of mass destruction in, the, in, the, uh, in, in terms of our war with uh, Islamic fundamentalists, uh, or, or terrorists is probably a more accurate description, and uh, the, some of the implications of uh, the advances in knowledge in biology. And the specific example I'll be talking about is actually genetics. Um, so there is, probably we ought to start by looking at the big picture. Uh, oh, I wanted, I forgot this one. Uh, when you're talking about the downside of, of technology, you can really take a very, very negative view. And actually, this view is, kind of a 19th century, early 20th century view. That is, technology is designed uh, to, uh, uh, to subjugate other people. So anyway, I want to take the larger view. And the first thing I want to think about is beginnings. Um, the creation of life, not humanity, but the creation of life on Earth uh, it's very hard to dream up a scenario for how this came about. It seems like it must have been a highly unlikely turn of events. And in fact, uh, I'm somewhat of the opinion that it was such an unlikely turn of events that if you consider that uh, there are probably many trillions of planets similar to ours that might support life, uh, we still might be the, the only living organisms in the universe. Uh, and we, in terms of some doomsday scenarios, which is what I'm going to get to, that's an imp that's an important thing to realize. So anyway, we're here somehow or another. Life life was created, and it reached the stage of producing uh, self-aware beings such as ourselves. And we also know that that uh, uh, we're essentially doomed because uh, if some large object doesn't hit the earth first, uh, eventually our sun uh, will become unstable. The hydrogen will be consumed. It will turn into a red giant, expand to reach the, uh, the orbit of the earth. And I think that at that point, the earth might be uh, really a, not a very nice place to live. And talking of going elsewhere, of course, this is many millennia in the future, and one doesn't know what will happen, but talking of going elsewhere uh, is not necessarily too realistic. Uh, there, but it might be possible to move to at least to another planet in our solar system, but eventually our star will become a white dwarf, and then we will be out of luck. So the bottom line is it's, uh, that uh, doomsday will come someday. But let's, it, let's see about it coming sooner. Let's talk about doomsday, various kinds of doomsday scenarios. There are really three different, we love doomsday stories. You know, there are all sorts of doomsday stories. Uh, and there are three different kinds. There's uh, 
the earth is destroyed uh, uh, because God has uh, ang become angry. Uh, something comes from outer space and gets us, or we do something to ourselves. And the one, what I really want to talk about is doing something to ourselves. But let's just look at the others. Just for, for example, the, in the Bible, there are two uh, sort of doomsday stories. One is the flood story, where only Noah's family survived. So it didn't wipe everybody else, but it came close. And the other is the book of Revelation, where the job is ultimately done and the end of the world comes. When you talk about things coming from outer space, there are two different kinds of things. One is you can have uh, intelligent beings coming from other worlds. And this example, this is the War of the Worlds. This is the old classic. And Independence Day essentially is a remake of the War of the Worlds. Uh, if life is as rare, first of all, uh, if, if there aren't other beings out there, which is kind of what I suspect, uh, there wouldn't be anybody to come. And if there were people out there, they couldn't get here because of the distances involved. Now, there are other ways it can come from outer space. Uh, in the Andromeda strain, uh, a pathogen came. Uh, a, a, a new life form came and killed people. Uh, generally, by the way, no, everybody doesn't get killed off in these stories. Uh, it's not a lot of fun to write a story and say, well, everybody died and it's all over. Uh, so, you know, we usually beat the, we usually beat the, the invaders from out of space or, or uh, in the case of the Andromeda strain, it decided to uh, mutate into something harmless. Uh, then things can hit the earth and in Lucifer's ham hammer, science fiction story, it actually did hit the earth and the story is about uh, people coping with that and, and uh, Carrying and continuing with their lives. And Armageddon, of course, is a movie where uh, uh, the, uh, the approaching asteroid was blown in half by a hydrogen bomb and went on each side of the Earth. Now, let's, what I really want to talk about is related to we did it to ourselves. And, and this is actually in chronological order of some of the classic stories of, of uh, ending of the world. Now, the first two, the world doesn't end, it becomes the opposite of a utopia, a, dy a dystopia. Um, and, and the world uh, apparently has ended in an unpleasant way uh, for humanity. And, and on the beach, of course, uh, there was an all-out nuclear war. The, the uh, air was poisoned with radioactivity, and everybody slowly died off of radiation sickness. In the Terminator series, uh, the uh, robots uh, uh, rebelled, essentially, in the future and took over the world. And this is, of course, all about, I haven't really watched much of the Terminator. I'm mostly the action scenes, not the, uh, not the plot. Uh, and, uh, and Prey uh, is about uh, uh, nanobots, which uh, are self-replicating uh, rapidly, uh, evolving creatures with a, a ability to communicate with each other and the, uh, some sort of collective intelligence. Uh, this uh, scenario uh, is, apparently there are actually people out there that worry about this. Uh, uh, this uh, I doubt if this is possible. Rick Smalley certainly doesn't think this is possible. Uh, if we are so far from being able to create, na create nanobots uh, that would, particularly ones that would be self-replicating, that uh, uh, it's, uh, it seems like uh, true science fiction. Now I want to rearrange these in the order in which I talk about them. I, so I'm going to dispense with the Terminator. There aren't we we don't we're so far from building intelligent robots that would take over the world that I don't think we need to worry about about Terminators. Um, so I want to talk about the nuclear situation, which is what On the Beach is about, uh, but not in terms of a real doomsday scenario. Uh, I fear that our problems are more likely to be dystopias than doomsday. I want to, I want to talk about prey, not from the point of view of these nanobots, but recognizing that 
biological organisms are nano machines uh, and uh, they work and they can be altered uh, to become quite dangerous. And then I want to talk about the two possible uh, dystopia visions of an unpleasant future that sort of come out, the 1984 comes out of the concept of, of nuclear and biological systems and the Brave New World uh, is going to be related to the advances in biotechnology and bioscience. So um, the, uh, let's talk first about the nuclear menace. Uh, this kind of, of picture of somebody who has to breathe through a filter is pretty characteristic of what people worry a lot about in a nuclear thing. They're, people are really creeped out by radioactivity. And they, uh, for example, in, in the Three Mile Island incident, uh, as far as anyone can tell, no one was exposed to an, a, an, an enhanced level of radioactivity that was as high as a background radiation. But there are still many people in that lived in that area that are convinced that they were somehow harmed by radiation. It's the idea that there's something sneaky that you can't smell, you can't see out there that's doing harm to you that really, uh, really bothers people. And so there is a certain element in, in the nuclear menace that's, uh, that's frightening in that sense. What I, we were really lucky not to have some sort of all-out nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. We really dodged a bullet. And I think um, the, uh, the words of Herman Kahn may have actually been heard on, in both, by both sides. Remember, Herman Kahn used to say the criterion about thermonuclear war is will the survivors envy the dead? And I think that, the, that our government and the government of the Soviet Union decided, yes, they probably would. At least we, we managed to avoid that. So that threat, which is sort of the ultimate threat, appears to have receded. And the kind of threats we have to worry about now are concerned with, uh, will, it, will the terrorists sneak a bomb into a US city and blow it up? And so uh, we need to consider uh, the issues that are cons around nuclear proliferation and what would be the sources of such a bomb. And this is a list of the known nuclear nations and the order of the list is the ones that seem the most dangerous to the ones that, to us, to the ones that seem the least dangerous. Uh, now there are, there are nuclear nations that everybody really, like Israel, that everybody thinks is a nuclear nation but they haven't proved it by blowing, you know, by doing a test. These are all the countries that have done a test. So why do I have Pakistan at the top of the list? Well, two reasons. One is that the stability of Pakistan is somewhat questionable. Remember, there were two assassination attempts on Musharraf in December. And the, uh, there are lots of folks in Pakistan who would like to, to change things and become more like the Taliban. Uh, there's also the fact that it appears that uh, Pakistan has really been active in, in creating nuclear proliferation. Uh, in the 4th of January, New York Times, uh, there was a discussion of nuclear proliferation, and they, this actually I've copied out of the, of the New York Times. This is an ad by the uh, a, Dr. A.Q. Khan Research Labs offering to sell parts for centrifuges, centrifuges which could be used to enrich uranium. Uh, and there's been a clear evidence that there's some, been, uh, some activity uh, in terms of making trades, or I don't know how strong the evidence is, but there's some suspicion that there's been activities in making trades between Pakistan and, and North Korea, where North Korea, where Pakistan provided nuclear information uh, to North Korea and perhaps these centrifuge materials and North Korea provided uh, missile information, missile technology to Pakistan. Anyway, uh, 
when you start selling materials to enrich uranium uh, on the open market, uh, this is a fairly strong indication that uh, you think that nuclear proliferation is a good thing. North Korea uh, probably will only help to proliferate nuclear weapons uh, if it really gets so financial in such a bad financial crunch that that's the only way to make money. Uh, but that's a strong possibility. Now, for ever since the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, there have been a lot of people in this country that have been worried about uh, nuclear, the, the control of nuclear materials in the former Soviet Union. I think most of them went, almost all the nuclear materials actually got back into Russia proper. And the uh, Clinton administration and the current administration are pretty active in trying to, see, trying to make sure that nuclear materials are secured in, this, in Russia. There are three items of interest. One, of course, is nuclear weapons. Uh, that would be the most attractive to terrorists because uh, you don't have to do any work. All you have to do is be told which button to push uh, to set it off. Um, they, the, probably the control on we weapons themselves is pretty good, but there's still a chance that a weapons would be smuggled out of Russia. They, uh, it's not clear whether the inventory really has all of those under control. Uh, the next most dangerous thing is highly enriched uranium because uh, highly enriched uranium is easier to make a bomb out of than uh, it's not as technologically challenging as making a bomb out of plutonium. And of course the final thing is plutonium. So there's been a lot of effort to make sure that materials are secured. The uh, U.S. is trying to get to Russia to uh, blend the highly enriched uranium down to, to the quantities that you, to the concentrations that are more appropriate for uh, reactor fuel. Uh, a big problem has been plutonium. What we would like the Russians to do with their plutonium is to mix it with reactor waste uh, to get it down to, to the point where it's really difficult to remove. And they're reluctant to do that because plutonium in principle uh, can be used as reactor fuel. I don't know of any actual power reactors that are using plutonium as a reactor fuel, but it does have energy value and they're reluctant to throw it away. Um, so that's actually, th these three countries are really the dangerous situation uh, for, different, for different reasons. Then uh, with respect to China, we're natural rivals of China. Uh, but our, our rivalry has been kind of friendly, uh, mostly friendly, and uh, I don't, you know, I don't see it turning the, that any other way. I, I'm a little concerned that the ABM initiative that we have uh, is going to to uh, frighten China into building more uh, uh, missiles and and nuclear weapons. Uh, purely because you have to be, if you're China, you have to be concerned it will work. And if it works, you want to be able to overwhelm it. So that, that, that does seem to me like it's likely to contribute to the arms race. Now, uh, the only problem I know of about India is that uh, when Pakistan and India were about to, to uh, have a war like a year or two ago, uh, there was a lot of concern expressed that command and control in Pakistan and India was not too, not too good, that people might start uh, using their nuclear weapons without proper authorization, and that's, uh, that is a little frightening to think about. France uh, believes in reprocessing nuclear fuel. That's, you can get a, a lot more energy out of that, but you also get plutonium out of that. And there are stories that the French are sort of trucking plutonium around France without having the necessary armed guards or the, uh, adequate armed guards. Anyway, I don't think, I think we've got uh, the UK and the US has got their m nuclear material fairly well under control, but there's always a possibility that they could actually steal it from us and use it against us. Now, just to, uh, to uh, mention the other people in the, 
in the mix. Israel almost certainly has a bomb, they, but they've kept it well under wraps. Iran seems to be trying to develop a bomb, although they're talking like they weren't. South Africa abandoned its program, and apparently Iraq abandoned its program before we invaded them, probably because they, they uh, had a lot of other problems to deal with. Now, um, Japan and Germany have certainly the technology to make weapons, and Japan may have the incentive as a counterbalance to North Korea. Uh, they, Japan, I would guess, could probably turn out a weapon in, within six months. They, the, you may remember that there was a criticality reaction, uh, accident in Japan in the fall of 2000. And the material that they, the, they had a solution of uranium, enriched uranium that was involved. And that, the enrichment was almost weapons grade. Uh, Japan was, uh, was is involved in, in, is interested in breeder reactors uh, like France was. And the, um, so they already have uranium that would not have to be enriched very much to be weapons grade. So what are the nuclear threats? Well, the worst one is if a, if a bomb went off in a US city. Uh, the cons consequences of that are uh, almost unimaginable. There would be tremendous loss of life, tremendous loss of property. Uh, the psychological effects would be devastating. Uh, the, it, might, it might set a chain in motion, and I'll discuss this in a minute, it might set a, a chain of events in motion that really changed us as a country. Um, so the number one priority should be to prevent this. And really this probably ought to be our government's number one priority, I think. Um, now another possibility would be an attack on a nuclear power station. Uh, our, our reactors are enclosed in domes. You could fly an airplane into the dome. Uh, the domes are pretty heavily reinforced. It probably wouldn't do anything. Uh, to do, have that happen, you'd have, to, it, it, you'd have to really have a very big plane or, or a lot of explosives on the plane to affect that. Another possibility would be to have an armed attack on a power station trying to either create a meltdown situation or trying to uh, get waste distributed, no, radioactive waste widely distributed. Uh, so the, 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 these things ought to be thought about. If I were a terrorist, this would not necessarily be a real attractive target if some, some elementary protective steps were taken. Uh, now the other thing is the dispersion of radioactive material the dirty bomb, oh, that's easy in terms of there's lots of radioactive material running around, not hard to get a hold of, uh, and the, uh, it wouldn't do a lot of damage, but since radioactivity creeps people out, uh, it would really be, you know, it could be quite disruptive, and it could, the cleanup operation could take uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, so anyway, the, the, these rapidly fall off compared to the top item, I think, in terms of something to sit around at nights worrying about. Um, so the, um, that's, that's the aspect of uh, nuclear threats. The other weapon of mass destruction, of course, uh, that's talked about a lot is, is biological weapons. Um, the um, biological weapons could actually wipe us out. That is, it, I think in principle it's possible to, to create a bug that could pretty much wipe out the, the world. Uh, it hasn't been done. Uh, it's hard to think of any reason for it to be done. The really, the really um, uh, in, in biological Weapons have not been used because you don't know who you're going to attack, whether it's going to be your friend or your foe, or you're going to get attack yourself or somebody else. And so um, in terms of conventional warfare, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, of reasons for, for uh, 
pursuing biowarfare other than the fear that the other person is going to do it. Um, I'll say something in a moment that seems to contradict that. The, what I'm, the, I'm using one particular source in talking about biowarfare, and that is uh, there was an article in a new magazine about biotechnology called Acumen. And in the uh, last issue for 2003, issue number four, there was a long discussion about biowarfare. Uh, some of the claims in it seemed a little far-fetched to me, but uh, I, I, will, I will try to scare you with them anyway. Uh, they, um, the, there are a large number of organisms that can be used as possibly as a biological weapon. And, and uh, the, one, the only one that uh, what you hear about mostly is anthrax, of course, since it was used in the fall of 2001. Uh, and uh, to some extent, people talk about smallpox. Um, but of course, Ebola, for example, is much more deadly than smallpox. And plague in its full-blown form is too. Uh, anthrax is the only material here that's really nice from, from the point of view of a weapons maker. It's nice for two reasons. One is it doesn't or it isn't ordinarily transmitted between, between humans. And that means that uh, you don't have to worry as much about shooting yourself in the foot, so to speak. Uh, you don't have to worry about it, it uh, attacking you. The other reason is that it can be, the anthrax spores can be s stored for a long time without losing their potency. So it's a convenient, relatively convenient material to handle. Um, the, um, One issue that one way you could say, well, let's why don't we protect ourselves? We could, you know, I, I don't think anybody really is seriously proposing this, but what, what if it got serious, how would you, you know, why don't we just vaccinate ourselves? Why don't we get vaccinated and uh, get protected against all these possible diseases? Well, there's uh, there's a fellow uh, who tried that. He, the uh, the Soviets after they signed the 1972 treaty uh, banning uh, work on offensive biological weapons uh, had a program that involved 60,000 people uh, working on developing biological weapons. And this guy was a director of the, uh, uh, the scientific direct uh, director of the whole program. Anyway, as you can read this uh, effectively. If you, if you get vaccinated against everything, your life can be pretty miserable uh, as a result of all the vaccinations. Uh, so uh, the, um, I don't know, can everybody have time to read this while I was talking? I don't want to sit here and read it for you. But uh, it's, it gets pretty ugly if you get vaccinated against everything. And he actually claims only anthrax plague and tularemia. Um, so this is actually the fellow who was a slide. He's changed, he's moved to this country, defected in the, around 1990, moved to this country, changed his name to, Americanized his name slightly, and he was the manager of the whole program. Their program was called Biopreparat. Uh, and the program was actually divided into three parts. A, uh, one part was Hunter, this guy was a, a uh, scientist in Hunter. And one, one was named Bonfire and one was named Flute. And they, um, they worked in complete secrecy. It's complete secrecy to have with employing 60,000 people. Um, in Hunter, uh, they tried to make more potent uh, weapons, more potent uh, viruses by combining their genomes. In flute, uh, they experimented with things that uh, affected the nerves or the, or the mind. And in bonfire, it's not clear what they did. I, I suspect that the thing that's left out here is working on, uh, on antibiotic resistant bacteria. So I suspect that that's what uh, bonfire was about. Uh, this was one of those organizations where, where every 
every part of the organization had a cover story and even the people at the top didn't necessarily know what they were doing. Uh, so that's why I say that, that Alabac didn't know it. So um, one of the interesting things is the question of what you can do with genetically engineered pathogens. And this is the part where I'm not sure where reality ends and, and uh, begins because uh, some of the things that I'm going to tell you are so scary that uh, they, and, but, but they also seem a little bit unbelievable. So uh, Popoff, for example, uh, it's claimed got his advancement in the program because he dreamed up a scheme where he would combine a, a pathogen like something like Legion, Leonair, Legionnaire's disease uh, uh, bacteria with a, some human DNA. And the idea was that uh, a person would get the Legionnaire's disease, they would be treated by tetracycline, for example, and this would activate the, D, the human DNA and it would essentially uh, cause the, the immune system to run amok and destroy people. Uh, effectively, this was supposed to attack the nervous system. It was involving the, the myelin sheaths. You know, the myelin is the material that uh, the, the sheaths nerves and when it uh, has, uh, uh, when, when, it, when it's a, eroded away and replaced by scar tissue, that's what gives rise to multiple sclerosis. And there are a number of other similar diseases involving myelin. Anyway, uh, this, his, his idea was to do genetic recombination and make the body turn against itself. And people would die essentially because their, their, uh, their, their, their uh, immune system attacked their nervous system. Then, they would sit around and dream up these things. Another example is uh, you combine uh, plague with Ebola. You, you splice the Ebola into plague, okay? And the idea is that people would come in with plague, be treated with antibiotics. This would cause the, somehow it would cause the Ebola to be expressed and people would, would be essentially walking Ebola time bombs. Ebola is a, is a disease which has such a short incubation period that it's usually self-limiting because people die before they can infect somebody else. Uh, and the, uh, this, this apparently was a way to, to spread it. So that's, uh, uh, I don't know how much of this is reality uh, because we, it's, these are the kind of experiments that are hard to demonstrate. You have to have guinea pigs. Uh, and uh, they presumably, if they're going to work, they have to be human guinea pigs. So this may be more conceptual than real. Um, but it is true that, that recombinant uh, gene work does have the potential of creating superbugs. I mean, you, you can combine various... If, the more you know about it, you, the more chance you have combining various genes. And so you can imagine creating a, something that would virtually wipe everybody out on the planet. You have to have something that's genetically stable. You have to have something with a long incubation period without symptoms, but contagious during that period. And then you ha it has to be antibi antibiotic and antiviral resistant. And it has to, once the symptoms appear, it has to be 100% fatal in a very short period of time. And it might be possible to create such a thing. Uh, there's, the question would be why. I mean, who would want to, to essentially attempt to end the world? But that's, that's a possibility. Now, the, the one other little final note about this that I wanted to mention is the question of psychotropic or, or neurotropic agents. Um, the, um, we all know about those things. They're, they're well known, alcohol, uh, marijuana, um, ecstasy. Um, and the 
nothing is known really about the, the Soviet program that I know, uh, but there is an illustration in connection with these things that I thought you might find interesting. Uh, this is a, a report on a presentation at a, at a scientific meeting. Uh, and, you know, this is a, this, uh, you have some, some old rats and you show that their mem memory works better and you show all the organic chemistry and then you very casually say, okay, if we just put a methyl group at this position, all memory is eliminated. Uh, and what, it's not so much from the point of view of the psychotropic effects here that I want to bring this up. It's the impingement on the way science works. That's, that's the interesting aspect of this. Science really works by communication. You do something, you tell somebody else, that gives them an idea, they go do something, and it works by this constant interaction and communication uh, between individuals. And so from a scientific point of view, this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, okay? Uh, it, uh, on the other hand, I, you know, it, it really is a little bit frightening to have people running around casually saying, okay, well, if you just do this, it has this enormous adverse effect. And this is a problem that, that is, going, it's, is going on now and it's likely to get worse in the scientific community between the government's desire not to have people going, going around telling things that might be used against us uh, versus uh, the need for, for the advancement of science to actually have free communication. And how this will, will play out, I don't know, but uh, uh, obviously this presenter wasn't too worried about this, this particular issue. So, um, what I have got up now is, is really what I'm worried about as a consequence of what I've been talking about. You remember in 1984, there was a world in which there was no privacy. The uh, uh, Big Brother was watching, is watching was the, the, the famous statement. Everything was regimented and controlled. Uh, it was sort of a very dark, uh, unpleasant world to be in. Uh, we're going to be, I, I, don't, I think the, the war between us and Islamic terrorists is going to last for at least 20 years. I don't see how we can win. I don't see how they can win. The consequence of a protracted war or on a society are very unple can be very unpleasant. I'll give you an example. This was in a recent New Yorker. Uh, remember the Peloponnesian War was between Athens and Sparta. It lasted 27 years. At the beginning of the war, the Athenians were very humane towards the people that they beat. You know, they treated them humanely. They were, it was a very humane society. Fifteen years into the war, they attacked a small Spartan con uh, colony on Melos. And they, uh, you know, they told the, the defenders, you either give in now or when we be beat you, we're, we're going to kill you all. And that's what they did. They, they killed all the men and they sold all the, sold all the women and children into slavery. And so... Uh, being in a protracted war can do a bad things to a society. And the Athenian society before the war was really one of the heights of civilization. If, for example, you know, God forbid, there was a detonation of a nuclear weapon in a U.S. city, the consequences to own our society what would happen to us, I think, would be really awesome. Uh, we really don't have much privacy now. I think we would have much less in, that, in the world uh, after that. So the, dis the kind of dystopia that 1984 represents is not something that I take too lightly. I think that that's, 
that uh, in our current circumstances, something to worry about. Well, let's talk about a different way of worrying about things. Uh, I'm, by the way, people, uh, when they have something that needs worrying about, they usually will, will just get me to worry about it because that, that's, uh, <laughs> that saves them a lot of time. Um, so I am a worrier. The, um, anyway, uh, the, the advances in bioscience and biotechnology give us new issues to wrestle with. And in one of the particular areas that they give you issues to wrestle, wrestle with is in human genetics. Because this is the code that's built into us. Uh, it's our own person. It's sort of our essence. And, and therefore, when you're getting into, into uh, uh, dealing with genetic information about an individual, you're really get, getting pretty close to the quick. Uh, I, now, a lot of this is coming from an article by Marth, R Mark Rothstein uh, in, a, in a Rice edited book, uh, edited by uh, Fred Rudolph and uh, Larry McIntyre. On the coming, it was, I can't remember the exact title, but it was, it was a concern with advances in biotechnology, and one of the issues was, was ethical and social implications. So, uh, the question is, uh, will genetic information remain private? Now, we already know in certain, certain circumstances it doesn't. They're, they're getting all these DNA databases for people who've been connect, convicted of felonies, particularly sex offenders. Um, and the, uh, uh, but, but who should it, you know, so it's hard to make it private. There are lots of people with a vested interest in your genetic information. We just talked about the government being interested in at least some people's genetic information. Insurance companies, both health insurance companies, life insurance companies, uh, uh, disability com insurance companies, are, they all have a stake in people's genetic information. Uh, the other members of your family have a stake in your genetic information. Because it may be that they, you know, if you have some, some uh, uh, genetic anomaly that causes you to be uh, susceptible to some disease, they have to worry about whether they are, they're susceptible. So where does your privacy end? You know, where does it, where, uh, uh, who's going who's gonna to control uh, this information? Of course, associated with privacy and genetic information is the question of stigma. You know, if you, uh, if everybody knows that you're going to get sick and die when you're 30, then they may not be want to, you know, you're sort of stigmatized. Who would want to invest in you, so to speak? Um, and and uh, there's also uh, the question if you know I mean, this, this hits close to home. Uh, you know, this is really already present. Uh, people who, are, who have diseases like Huntington's disease in their families, you know, they're, they're, li they're, they're living in this fear of a time bomb. You know, they can be tested and discover that they're going to get it. Or they can not be tested and worry about whether they're going to get it. So it's a, uh, uh, there's, there's this whole issue of, for people who are, who have the genes for Huntington's disease, the, the clearly they you, it, it doesn't make any sense for them to reproduce. They're going to it's a progressive disease. The people it, 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 the genetic anomalies get worse and worse. I think this is Huntington's. It may be a closely related one uh, with gen, from generation to generation. So eventually it gets into the it, the children actually become susceptible in, in, if, after enough generations. So there becomes a question of eugenics. You know, eugenics used to be big before the, first, before the Second World War. It was big in the US. It was even bigger in Sweden and even bigger in Nazi Germany. 